Good morning. Good to see each of you here today. It's, uh, it's been a good day, and, and it's really good to have uh, those back who were, have been apart from us and, and had less health, and they're enjoying today. And just reminds us that God, uh, God is good, and God continues to, to bless. We've been, uh, well, actually, it was just last week, I started this series with you on real reality. <laughs> I was surprised to learn that that's actually a term. Um, I, I really, I, I don't even know what made me look it up because I just, I just thought, well, before you put that on the slide, you might should make sure it's not, you know, something crazy. And then there it was. And uh, because of the online world and uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, all kinds of things that are out there, that are going on, um, Lucinda and I went to see a movie yesterday that was all about some of that stuff, and it was it was frightening. I'll just be honest with you. You know, they can make it look real on the big screen, and it is real because it's happening. But uh, the second item that I wanted to look at after just kind of establish some of the reality that uh, that's underneath the things that we believe, and I'm going to return to some of those slides midway through. <clears throat> I want to talk about spiritual growth, and I call it real growth. <laughs> Lucinda and I were in the preacher's office that uh, we were working with in California, and uh, one day he, he asked us if, if we were real. And uh, he, was, he was famous for doing things like that, and you know, we tried to argue with him a little bit, and he finally he said, no. No, he says, the things that you can see are not going to last. They're temporary. The real thing is inside you. The spiritual world is the real world. And the world says the spiritual world isn't the real world. And see how we get all messed up when we, when we start thinking in that term. Well, it doesn't mean that God didn't really make a physical body. And of course, in John, uh, the book of 1 John, we're reminded that there would be people come along and say that Jesus didn't actually inhabit a real body. And he did. And that's, that was the basis of, of the things we were studying last week. I want us to look at uh, 2 Peter. Actually, turn to 1 Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 1. Um, I put on the screen verses uh, 2 and 3. I'm going to read verse 1 uh, and, then, and then catch the screen here. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. By the righteousness of God our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. And then verse 4 says, By these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now if you can pack more than that in three or four sentences, good luck. I mean, it's going to take me five or six slides just to, just to kind of bring some of those things back to our minds. One thing that Peter does quite often is he uses the word precious. He starts with it here, and uh, he's, he's going to use it several times. He talks about our faith being precious, the precious promises, precious and magnificent actually. In First Peter, he talked about we're redeemed with precious blood of a lamb. And just for good measure, he says uh, that Jesus was a precious stone and that he is our precious Savior and Lord. He likes that word. Now, I, you know, I looked up precious to, to find a picture. Uh, that's the best I can do. Um, I, I, want you to, I want you to feel what it's like to, to really treasure and value something. And, uh, and so Peter is saying, you know, what we have what has been given to us is, is number one, precious. Secondly, 
he talks about a divine nature. Now, I'm, I'm going to use the word spiritual here. And, and that, for me, says it comes from God. Now, in our world today, the word spiritual is kind of generic. But, um, and that's why I think Peter's quite specific. What we have comes from God. And the nature uh, that, that we look at, and I don't mean nature as in trees and rocks. I mean the nature of things. Uh, the quality of things, the characteristics of things, is divine. It is from God. And that's going to become important in just a moment. As I mentioned to the kids this morning, uh, Peter says that God made sure we have everything for life and for godliness. Those are actually grapes from Israel, and it reminds me of the conquest of Canaan when the spies went over and they had to carry a bunch of grapes on a pole between two men. Now you understand why. Because it was so long and you, you know, you're just not going to carry that back on a journey unless you take care of it. Everything we need. I mean, when, <laughs> when, when you think about what you need and, and then as the kids admitted this morning, then you get out on your trip and you think, oh, you know, I left that other thing. You know, I left the most important thing. Uh, it's true. God didn't do that to us. He, he doesn't come along and say, oh, you needed one of those? I'm sorry, I, I didn't think about that. Never going to happen. Just not going to happen. And no matter what situation you find yourself in, God has thought of that. And He makes sure that we have everything we need. It's very, very important. Now, when I go back over these verses, and I just, I just think about, God's side of it. And, and I'm trying kind of to emphasize this to us. He starts with grace and peace. And of course that's the, the I call it the Gentile greeting, the, the Christian greeting, that we have grace in Christ. And then the Jewish greeting of peace, shalom. Grace and peace to all of us. That's, that's the primary product that is provided to us. And it comes because we know God. God makes Himself known to us, as we talked about last week. And He gives us, from His divine power, He grants us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And it comes with glory and excellence. Uh, we'll return to the word excellence here in just a minute. We have these precious and magnificent promises. And when... When God's nature is made known in creation, made known in us, and all the gifts that He gives us, He does not simply show them to us. He allows us to partake of them. We get to use them. We get to experience them. I don't know if you've ever been you know, shown something really, really precious by your uncle. You know, but you can't touch it. Get your hands off of that. <laughs> you know, what, what's the matter with you? You can't touch that. God doesn't do that. He says, let me show you something really precious. And you, you can have all of this you want, and you can, you can touch it. John said, we did. We touched. Our hands handled. And all of that will help us escape the corruption that is in the world. And, and if, if you haven't seen something that you'd like to get away from, uh, there's plenty. There's plenty of corruption out there to escape. Now, the main part of the lesson this morning, and I'm not, not because I'm going to spend the most time on it, but I want to, I want to take a, a deep dive into the next three verses because we are told what is involved in this divine nature. And he's quite specific. And there are things that, that honestly, we, we do have a grasp on. I'll read them, then we'll go back through them. Now, for this very reason also, because he's done all these things for us, Applying all diligence in your faith. Supply moral excellence. In your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. In your self-control, perseverance. In your perseverance, godliness. In your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. Now that's... That's seven things to add, to add, to supply, to bring to the table. Uh, and and it's, 
it's kind of hard to visualize that, and I've, I've chosen a, a pictorial way of representing this, and it's, it's, a, it's a huge tree. Because if you've seen a tree grow, they don't start with all those limbs. But the limbs that get added are still part of the whole. And they depend on each other. And, and that's what these items are meant to be. We start with moral excellence. And as the tree grows, that moral excellence, we can add knowledge to that. Now, let's, let's define that briefly. Moral excellence is your superpower for all of our Marvel and uh, other superhero friends. Uh, you understand it's, it's the part that represents you and it is, it is meant to be way beyond just the standard. That's why we could say super. It's, it's not just morality, it's moral excellence. And it really has to do with the idea that you're, you're doing what you were created to do. If you're a plant, you're producing fruit. If you're a tool, you're helping fix something or build something. You're doing exactly what you were created to do. And in our world today, moral excellence is in uh, short supply. There, there's a fair amount of morality. In fact, you can find honor among thieves. Do you want to be next to one? No, thank you. I, I'll keep my stuff. Thank you very much. Because it's not complete excellence. It's just excellence to a point. <laughs> That's not good enough. And so when we come to Christ and we believe what He has shared with us and all these magnificent gifts and promises that He shared with us, we want to meet Him in an excellent way. And it begins in our morality. Now the term knowledge here is not the same term for knowledge that's in other verses that we will also read. That's the general knowledge that we have or the knowledge of God that we have. This particular knowledge is the kind of practical knowledge. It's, it's when you really know how to do something because you've done it. Lucinda and I have this joke every semester she starts teaching and she explains to them that you can't do algebra by watching me do it. Because the kids go out of class and they go, yeah, I understood that. Yeah, I understood that. I understood every step. Here, do it. Uh, uh, I don't know where to start. Yeah, because you didn't do any of it. She did. The only way to do some things is to do it. <laughs> You cannot learn to ride a bicycle watching videos. That's not how it works. Because when you get on your bicycle, it's not going to feel that way. And by the way, you can't just add a new life. <laughs> so, that's not going to work. Um, this knowledge is you really can use what you know and you're able, because you've practiced, to actually do it correctly and do it over and over. It's practical knowledge. Now, of course, that leads to self-control, and that's sort of explained, isn't it? Because any of the skills that we have, you know, you need the right amount of control in the right place at the right time. James says, the hardest thing to control in us, that's right, is our tongue. Well, all right. And if you can control that, you can control your whole body. So I suggest it as a great starting place. If you want to control what's in your heart, start letting your mouth tell you what's in your heart and then go back based on what you've been saying and take that second look at your heart. Because Jesus says that's really where everything starts. We have to be controlled. Uh, we can't just say anything we want to. We can't just do anything we want to. We can't just say, well, that feels good. Let's do it all the time. I mean, you ever sat down to a good meal and said, this was really, really good. Let's, let's just do this for two or three hours. Y you won't feel the same way in three hours. Or in 30 minutes. You know, there's too much of a good thing. So there has to be control and it has to be exercised in every area of our lives and in, certainly in the corruption that we're trying to escape that's in the world. 
And then he goes from self-control to perseverance, which again makes logical sense because as we're controlled, that's hard. It does not come easy. It does not come automatically. And have you ever had one of those weeks where by Wednesday you're asking yourself, could we just have Friday now? Because there's just so much that just keeps seeming to go wrong. You know, the devil's just having a heyday throwing roadblocks in front of you. Like it, nothing seems to be going right. Well, guess what you need for that? You need the ability to keep going down the road. I mean, you've got to stay at work all the way through Friday. You, you can't just take off because you're tired. It doesn't work that way. And we need people as Christians who are going to get through the hard times. They're going to be, let the trial produce in them the patient endurance that it's meant to produce, James 1. They need to stay with the right thing even when it's hard, even when it's unpopular, even when they get in trouble for it, even if they could lose their job over it. They say, that's okay, I'll do what's right. You can have your job. That's perseverance. Godliness is pretty self-explanatory. It's being like God. But it's also a recognition that it's coming from God. We are like God because we are watching God, because we have the knowledge of God, because we continue to experience God. And when people look at us, what they see is God. And, and we are godly, God-like. The last two seem pretty self-explanatory, but they're, they're different in a very key way. They're both words for love, by the way. Brotherly kindness is Philadelphia. It is brotherly love. But notice that the translators say, yes, but what we're talking about is brotherly kindness. Not just that I feel an affiliation with people like who are in my church or in my family. I actually am kind to them. So that kind of kicks in the head this idea, well, I love them, but I don't have to like them. I don't know where that came from. It's not in the Bible. No, you're supposed to be kind. And by the way, your love is supposed to be sincere. So see, that just knocks that in the head right on to the first two points. Brotherly kindness means I feel kindness. I want to exhibit kindness. I want to do kindness. I want... That, that sense of brotherhood, of family, of congregation, of faith, to be a warm experience between us. But love goes beyond that in, in the sense of agape. This is the love that God so loved that He sent His Son. Did He want to send His Son? No. Only because we needed it. Was that even palatable? It was going to cost everything. It's sacrificial. And at those times when, when, we, when it's tough to love, but we need to love anyway, because we're around someone that doesn't really smell like what I want to be around. Or someone that doesn't do the kind of things that I want to be around. Well, can you be around anyway because you need to love them? And you need to love them the way Jesus loved them. And what did Jesus do? He was with those who were tax collectors and sinners. So we love, and He loved all the way to the cross. And He loved on the cross to the people that put Him on the cross. You see, I can think of several ways why this one is like the top of the list. This is like when you've, when you've mastered the others, you're ready to, to try to master this. Good luck and take the rest of your life. But this is what God wants to develop in us. And this is so important. As he goes on to say, if these qualities are yours and increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Let's break that down a little bit. He's going to go two more verses. Applying all diligence, he started with. This is work. Supply these qualities. You're not given 
everything you need and there's nothing you need to do. That's not the end of that sentence. You're given everything you need in order to let these qualities grow in you. And you need to supply them. And you need to increase them. If they're yours and increasing, then you are useful and you are fruitful. You can see how the effort is assumed in this. I'll come back to that. Are you lacking these qualities? Peter says the problem is you have forgotten something very important. Maybe you can't see it. Maybe you're just being short-sighted. It's there, but it's not in your vision at the moment. You're forgetting your purification from your former sins. So this person is, is rude to you. And you were never rude. Maybe you need to remember you have committed this sin, and therefore it's time to be patient with someone who's committing it in your presence. If I, if I don't develop these qualities, it's because I've forgotten what Jesus did for me. And that's very, very crucial. And then he finishes uh, this section with verses 10 and 11. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this, uh, in this way, the entrance to the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. We spent several weeks talking about that kingdom and that entry and inheritance that we have. And that's where Peter ends this discussion. Be all the more diligent. Make certain. He's called you and chosen you. You make it certain. You make it good. You make it worthwhile because you're practicing these things. You're growing in these ways. And this is, this is how we really enter into the kingdom. And in my opinion, what Peter's doing is combining the entrance and the inheritance in, this, in that verse. To say this is how you get in, but this is how you stay in, and this is how you finally get the inheritance. That will be abundantly supplied to you, because he does speak there in the future tense. This is, I want to call it observable growth. These qualities are spiritual qualities, but you can see them. Can you see when someone is patient? Absolutely. How are they patient? Because their face looks patient? No, because the spiritual quality is through them. And it's observable. It can be seen. It can be experienced. So look, these three sh slides I showed last week. Jesus was real. They saw him. They heard him. They stared at him. They handled. Physically handled, they were with Jesus. Their faith and our faith is real. John and Peter both said, we were eyewitnesses of his glory and the prophetic word for you is made sure because we saw it. And so our faith is real in things that are spiritual because of things that physically happened. The gospel is real. Remember he died, was buried, was raised, appeared before many. These eyewitnesses spoke of that presence and his deeds and of his victory over death and the resurrection. All of these things are real. They're all based on actual evidence. Evidence that would fly in a courtroom today. This is not cooked up stories, as Peter said as we talked last week. The evidence is real. Go ahead, two, two slides for me. Uh, one more. So I want to look at this idea of divine power. It's one of, our, one of our applications, one of our conclusions. This is God's love. It's God's call on our lives. It's God's kingdom. These, these qualities are divine qualities. Now I want to address something. It's this... You may disagree with me right off the bat. It's kind of popular to think that we look outside the body of Christ and we see our neighbor and we see whoever and we look at these people and they're, they're good people, right? Well, that may be true. Not in the sense that the Bible uses the word good. Jesus wouldn't even let someone call him good. 
<laughs> so, you know, the, the word has a deeper meaning than that. But I want to say, our neighbors are not divine. They may be good neighbors. They may be able to express kindness. Can they express brotherly kindness the way Christians do because of Jesus? That's just a different level. It is a spiritual quality that does not exist in unredeemed people. We have these things because of Jesus. And so it's really not correct to look out there and set the judgment and say, well, you know, pretty good is good enough. Everybody's going to heaven. That would be wonderful if it would only be true, but it isn't. And the qualities that are being described here are divine qualities. They're spiritual realities. They come in a relationship with Jesus. And lacking God's love, God's call, God's kingdom, my obedience to those things, it's coming up short. Which, of course, is the whole definition of sin. Missing. Just barely. <laughs> but a miss is still a miss. Secondly, relationships are hard work. I'm thinking about the apostles trying to have relationship with these congregations. And Peter, and the next thing he's going to say is, you know, I'm not going to be around forever, and I hope you can remember what I've been saying because I'm an eyewitness, and you really need to know these things. In fact, I'll write it down so you can. <laughs> that relationship between the apostles and those who, who listened to them and obeyed the gospel, and then here comes the next teacher. As the next chapter goes on to say, there's going to be a false teacher show up too at your door. He's going to try to tell you that what I told you wasn't really it. That what they want to say is the reality. No, you already had everything you needed for life and godliness. You don't need some new approach. You don't need a new gospel. You don't need some new way of looking at it. That relationship between the apostles and the believers was a relationship that took hard work. And every relationship from family to congregation to our relationship with outsiders, every one of these relationships is hard work. It's going to require diligence. There are seven qualities to add to your faith. That whole idea says it's going to take some work to do that. And it's going to most of all require perseverance. I've got to I've got to continue working and increasing and applying this diligence in order to make this truly real in my life from now on. It's going to take daily effort. So, it is a myth. It's my last application. The phrase, there's nothing you can do to be saved, is actually a myth. Now, am I talking about Jesus not doing everything that needed to be accomplished in order to save us? No, I'm not saying that at all. That is absolutely all God. But when Jesus did all those things, just like the two thieves, there was one that wanted to go, and there was one that didn't care. And the only one in paradise that day was the one that wanted to go. When you look at this list of qualities, you cannot look at that list and say, well, you know, I'll just pray and God will just give me everything. He did give you everything. Everything you need to build those qualities in your life, it's up to you now to build those qualities. And if you don't do the spiritual work, you will not arrive at the spiritual destination. It's not going to happen. To say that there's nothing you can do sets us up to believe that we can sit and let God do the work, not only to become a Christian, but from now on. And as we've many times argued, it, it's really hard to see belief and confession and repentance and baptism as things that have absolutely nothing to do with us. But we're the one that's being asked to do those things. I have to believe. I have to repent. I, with my mouth, have to confess. I partake in the divine nature in the gospel itself by being, by dying, being buried, and raised from the dead. It's not that any of those things would do any good without Christ. All of that would be zero without the blood of Christ. But I have to say, I'm in. 
And I have to keep saying that by developing these qualities to say, you know, having your salvation is great, but I want all of you. I want godliness. I want your, your kind of love to be the excellence that rules my life. I put this at the bottom to remind me. Peter's favorite phrase, I don't, I don't quite get it. <laughs> he says, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, over and over. A lot of people want Jesus as their Savior. Not so sure about the Lord part. Yeah, save me, Jesus. Save me, Jesus. Get behind me. i got work to do. i got my own life to live. I don't need you for the rest. Oh, yes, you do. Peter said, our ideas aren't always the right idea. And we really need our Lord to tell us what's right. And we need our Savior to forgive us because right isn't easy. And so at the third chapter of this book, I want to book in that chapter the way he did. Verse 2 and verse 18 of 2 Peter 3. He says, remember. Remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. You, you, need, you need all of the scriptures. It, it, that's, part, that's your main toolkit for, for developing these spiritual qualities. You need every story, every description, every definition. You need all of that for you to really put it all together. And then he says at the end of his book, final words apparently in Peter's writings, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and in the day of eternity. I'll take that as the judgment day. The day when eternity begins. You're going to need it now and you're going to need it for the rest of eternity. His grace and the knowledge of all of these precious and magnificent promises that give us the qualities that make us God-like. I, I pray this morning that, that you'll see your spiritual walk as something that's going to require more effort than you've been giving it. That's my conclusion for me. Join me in that. It's going to take more reading. It's going to take more meditation. Something that's in short supply in most of our lives because of our busyness. It's going to take more diligence. That's hard work, sustained, persevering. In order to really, really understand what spiritual qualities God wants me to have. If we can assist you in any of the ways I've described today, it is our privilege and our honor. Will you come to the front while we stand and sing?